Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'd like to call to order the TOTOG Management Board. Our first order of business this afternoon will be to approve the agenda as has been provided. Are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, is there any objection to acceptance of the agenda as provided? Therefore, the agenda is adopted by consent. Our next order of business is approval of the proceedings from the February 2016 board meeting. May board meeting. It was the... Any discussion about those proceedings? Any objection to accepting them as provided? Seeing none, they are hereby accepted. Our next order of business will be public comment for any items that are not on the agenda today. Is there any member of the public that would like to comment on anything not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move right along. We'll next go through a couple of presentations about the regional stock assessments that have been done for Long Island Sound and the New Jersey, New York Bite regions. What we'll do is we'll first receive those reports on those two assessments. After those two reports have been given, we'll stop and pause for any questions that pertain to those reports. We'll then go on to the presentation of the peer review panel report, stop after that for questions, and then at that point, the decision point before the board would be whether to accept those for management use. We're not making the decision about the amendment. We'll have that discussion afterwards, but we'll just have to decide whether to accept those assessment reports for management use. So with that, I'll turn to Ashton, and she can direct the discussion of those stock assessments. Thank you. There you go. Hi. I'm actually going to turn it over to Jacob to begin the Long Island Sound stock assessment report. Thank you very much, Ashton. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who's involved in uh, producing the Long Island Sound Stock Assessment and the New York, New Jersey Bite Stock Assessment. Uh, Dr. Eric Schultz, my advisor at UConn, Jeffrey Brust, unfortunately can't be here today, and Jason McNamee is going to be prevent presenting uh, in his absence. Uh, Greg Wojcik, Sandy Dumai, Dr. Katie Drew, Ashton Harp, and there was significant input from the Technical Committee and the Stock Assessment Subcommittee. So present, we're presenting here the Long Island Sound Stock Assessment, which is shown in green, yellow, and also the New Jersey, New York Bite, which is shown in orange. Previously, Tatog was assessed by a single stock unit, uh, but there's some flaws in the coastwide single stock unit assumption, such as regional differences in the fishery, strong site fidelity, localized spawning, and variations in life history. Uh, in response to that, in the previous benchmark stock assessment, a, an uh, alternative stock assessment structure was presented with uh, three regions, uh, one of which was southern New England, which uh, included the Connecticut portion of Long Island Sound, and the next region, the, the region further south from that, was the New York, uh, New Jersey, re, uh, New York, New Jersey, which included a portion of Long Island Sound. There was a highly regarded alternative to that, which grouped Connecticut with New York and New Jersey. Um, what we're presenting here is a Long Island Sound specific stock assessment. So we split Long Island, Long, Long Island into North and South, and the North going to Long Island Sound and the South going to the New York, New Jersey bite region. Uh, in addition to that, so the, the, uh, this uh, keeps Long Island Sound as a continuous region. And in addition to that, uh, new data was accessed and included in this stock assessment. This stock assessment runs from 1984 to 2014. Uh, we have recreational harvest and discards. For the recreational discards, we've assumed a 2.5% mortality rate, which is in, uh, consistent with the benchmark stock assessment. Uh, commercial harvest runs from 1984 to 2014. Commercial discards were not included. The commercial harvest is uh, about 10% of the recreational harvest, and obviously the discards are much lower than that, uh, and there wasn't enough data available to um, estimate that 
uh, efficiently. So that, that those were not included. Uh, there are there is fishery independent survey data, fishery dependent indexes included, and also the biological samples are both fishery independent and dependent. Uh, data was treated uh, in the following manner. Connecticut data was used as is with the assumption that all Connecticut harvest comes from Long Island Sound. New York had to be split to Long Island Sound and South Shore. For the recreational data, starting in 1988, there was a Long Island specific area code, which made uh, the partitioning uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, prior to that, there was no Long Island Sound specific area code, so we had to use a multi-year average to full, fill in those earlier years. Uh, similarly, with commercial data, uh, the, the Long Island Sound VTR statistical area uh, started to be used in 1986, and then prior to that, we used a multi-year average. Uh, this is the harvest in metric tons over the, for the time series for Long Island Sound. And as you can see, uh, in the early uh, decade and a half or so of the time series, we have a general decreasing trend and harvest. Uh, since then, there's been pretty uh, an interannual fluctuations, but the harvest has generally increased. And uh, the, the next figure is the Long Island Sound catch at age. On the left, we have our, uh, the age of the fish, and uh, on the y-axis, the age of the fish, and on the x-axis is the years. And what we can see is in most recent years, we have fewer older fish and fewer smaller fish. Uh, obviously, the fewer smaller, younger fish is following uh, increased regulation of minimum length. The indices included in this assessment are the Connecticut Long Island Sound Trawl Survey, which is an adult index, the MRF's catch per unit unit effort index, which is also an adult index, the New York Trawl Survey, which was used as an age one index, and uh, two portions of the Western Long Island Seine Survey, which is a young of the year survey, and uh, th those sites are from Little Neck Bay and Manhasset. Uh, generally, we see a decreasing trend in all these indices, some interannual variations as well, but the indices are pretty, uh, fo follow each other pretty, uh, the trends are pretty similar in the indices. The results of our model are as, following, uh, as follows. We have uh, our F, and in red we have the three-year average for fishing mortality, and we can see generally increasing F over the time series. Spawning stock biomass is generally decreasing over the time series, and the number of recruits is generally decreasing over the time series, with one large recruitment event uh, most recently in 2013. The Technical Committee uh, approved MSY as the biological reference point for this stock assessment. Uh, there was a strong fit to the stock recruit relationship. We have included the SPR reference points for this because the New Jersey, New York bite region relied on SPR reference points. Uh, for MSY, the target is FMSY and the threshold is the F that produces 75% MSY. Uh, and in e either of these approaches, MSY or SPR, were both in overfishing and have been overfished. Uh, looking at the stock status uh, over time, uh, including our target and threshold for fishing mortality, we can see that most of the last 10 years we are above our threshold. Uh, and here the, the, the orange color line is our three year F average. And for spawning stock biomass, uh, we are below our threshold for most of the last 10 years. To address model uncertainty, we looked at sensitivity to input data. So we uh, dropped various indices in the survey. We added millstone survey data. Millstone's a power plant in Connecticut, which has collected larvae and egg um, abundances uh, for a number of years for Chautauqua. So we included that in one of the sensitivity analyses. We started in 1988 to uh, eliminate uh, estimation of landings in the early years. We included a fifth, we ran it as using a 15 year plus group instead of a 12 year plus group, which is the base model. And then to address the uh, issues of estimating the New York harvest in the, uh, both recreational and commercial in the early years, for those early years, we either included all of the New York harvest into Long Island Sound or we excluded all of the New York harvest into Long Island Sound to kind of look at the extremes of what those assumptions, uh, how they, they impact our stock assessment. 
We also looked at sensitivity to model structure. So uh, we merged the, our selectivity blocks three and four into uh, w one selectivity block, so we ended up with three selectivity blocks. And then retrospective analysis was performed using a six-year peel. Please note that this crosses a, sl a selectivity block. Um, and there's nothing outstanding in the retrospective analysis, and I ha there are extra slides if people are interested. The sensitivity results are shown here. We have SSB trajectory, again, uh, general decline uh, over the time series, and all of the different analyses are relatively similar. Uh, and for F average, are, are in each of the sensitivity analyses, they're quite similar, and we have a general trend of increasing F. And for estimating the number of recruits, uh, generally decreasing over time, similar patterns in all the sensitivity analyses, uh, and the strong recruitment event in 2013 is pretty consistent. Uh, stock status sensitivity. So uh, because of time constraints, we weren't able to calculate uh, F threshold for each sensitivity analysis. So he presented here is the terminal F relative to FMSY, which is the target, not the threshold. But generally what we see is terminal F is larger than FMSY in all but one of our uh, sensitivity analyses. The results of this uh, assessment is that the model is robust to input data and model configuration. The stock is overfished and overfishing is, occurred, is occurring. Uh, and the status is reasonably consistent with the alternate regional model configuration from the benchmark. And here I've presented, uh, you can see the Long Island Sound MSY and SPR approaches as you've already seen. And in the last column is the Southern New England MSY from the previous benchmark. Um, and, and you know, the, the trends are quite similar in all of these. Uh, and that's what I have for Long Island Sound. Okay, thank you very much, Jacob. We'll go to Jay next to do the New York, New Jersey bite, and then we'll come back to questions on both of these reports. You guys see it? All right. Um, my name is Jason McNamee. I work for the Rhode Island Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, Jeff Brust from New Jersey, who was the analyst on this assessment, uh, couldn't attend, uh, so I offered to pinch hit for him. Um, I was involved enough uh, that I, I think I have a, a decent feel for it, and uh, Jeff and I talked a lot before this meeting, uh, developing this presentation. Uh, the format is very similar to what you just looked at, so that'll, uh, at least you'll be seeing the same uh, types of information. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to track this fairly well. So <clears throat> this is now the, uh, we're calling it the New Jersey, New York bite assessment. Um, what you can see is we're talking about this orange area now on there. So it's the entirety of New Jersey and the south shore of New York's Long Island. Uh, data types, and just to note up front, these are all consistent with um, choices that were made for the benchmark uh, assessment, uh, more or less. Uh, but we used recreational harvest from 1984 to 2014. Uh, recreational discards for the same time period, uh, the assumption being that 2.5% of them end up uh, as removals. Commercial harvest for the same time period. Commercial discards are not included, and this was also consistent with the benchmark. We did some sensitivity testing on that in the benchmark. We didn't do that here uh, just because of the um, time frame that we were working with. Uh, we used fishery independent survey data, fishery dependent index data, and then uh, fishery independent and fishery dependent biological samples. So the treatment of the data, uh, the New Jersey data was used as is, meaning uh, New Jersey was easy to deal with it. We just had to grab the New Jersey data, didn't have to do anything special to it. The New York data was split by area. So um, we had the Long Island Sound piece of New York and uh, the South Shore piece of New York. And so um, based on the work that Jacob did um, for the Long Island Sound version, we just 
uh, removed the remaining New York harvest and that was attributed to the South Shore. Uh, the recreational data goes from 88 to 2014. Uh, just as Jacob described, this is when we can kind of pick out from the MREP data, this Long Island Sound specific area code, we can kind of identify it as occurring in Long Island Sound. Uh, prior to that, we used a multi-year average harvest approach, just like Jacob described. Um, and again, the South Shore is all of New York minus uh, New York information that's attributed to Long Island Sound. Uh, commercial data, very similar approach, 88 to 2014, um, used VTR statistical areas, how we kind of partition that uh, information up. And then in the period of time when we didn't have that, 84 to 87, again, used a multi-year average harvest uh, approach. So here's a look at harvest. Um, you can see the top uh, graph there on the y-axis is metric tons. Along the bottom is year. Uh, you can see a lot of interannual variability. Uh, not surprising given that this is a predominantly recreational fishery. Uh, so it's very much dependent on the estimates coming out of uh, MRIP. So you see that jagged, but basically uh, you had a higher period of harvest early in the time series that has dropped down to a lower um, harvest in more recent time. Uh, the bottom chart there, the bubble plot, what you have on the y-axis there is age, so it goes from age 1 up to uh, age 12 going up the y-axis. Along the bottom again is year, and so the idea here uh, it, couple of things you can get out of these plots. I don't know that you get either of them from this plot, but um, you can, you know, track cohorts to some degree. I, I'd show you if I could get my cursor up there, but I can't. Uh, so you can use your imagination, and what you're looking at is you're following things up diagonally from left to right going up the y-axis, and what you want to see are those bubbles kind of getting smaller in size, and that's kind of the decay that occurs uh, on a cohort through time. Um, and it's not as pronounced uh, in this graph. You saw it in Jacob's uh, graph pretty nicely, but as uh, management measures went in, you see that shift um, in harvest. And I don't know, if you use your imagination, maybe you can see it there as well. But uh, it was showed up real nice in the Long Island Sound version. Okay, the fishery independent uh, information that went into this assessment. Uh, the New Jersey Ocean Trawl was the main uh, fishery independent trawl survey uh, that went into this. Um, there was also MRFs or MRIP uh, catch per unit effort index that uh, went into this assessment. Uh, both of those uh, alias adult portions of the population. And then there was the Jamaica Bay Seine Survey. So this is a piece of the Western Long Island Seine Survey, uh, but this is a piece that we thought was a little more applicable to this um, stock assessment region, and so we kind of peeled off that data and used that as a Young of the Year index. Model results. Uh, just as Jacob described, so top left, that is fishing mortality. So fishing mortality increases going up the y-axis. Uh, year uh, increases going along the bottom, left to right. Um, and so what you see is a solid blue line. That's the actual point estimate year to year. It's the median um, estimate. And then there are some bounds of uncertainty. Those are the hashed lines, uh, 95th and 5th confidence interval. But for Tatog, what we've done in the past and what also came out of the benchmark is a three-year average. Uh, a lot of that is due to the interannual variability we get, and so we use a three-year average, and so that's what that red line is. That seems a little bit smoother going across the, the um, blue line there. Uh, and what you can see is that fishing mortality beginning in the early 2000s to present has been kind of increasing, uh, again, with some variability. Uh, top right hand side, is it your right? Yeah, it's your right too. Um, is uh, SSB, spawning stock biomass, uh, same sort of information without that three year average here, but you've got the solid line is your median 
point estimate with bounds of uncertainty. And then uh, bottom left-hand side is a recruitment index. I'm sorry, a recruitment information, rather. Uh, again, the median estimate uh, is the solid blue line there. And you can see, uh, I think there was a, uh, in this case, I'm not sure if it's 2012 or 2013, but later in the time series is a, a large recruitment event in this information as well, which is interesting. Uh, biological reference points. So in the case of New Jersey, New York bite, uh, the MSY-based reference points were deemed unreliable. There was a poor fit to the spawner recruit relationship. Um, there's an estimate of steepness that the model produces, and as it gets really close to one, basically what the model is telling you that there's no information uh, with which to estimate that steepness parameter. Um, so take home point is uh, we weren't able to use MSY-based reference points here. We had to default to uh, SPR-based reference points for the New Jersey, New York bite stock assessment. And so based on uh, what we agreed to in the benchmark assessment, the target uh, were 40% SPR um, metrics, and then the threshold was a 30% SPR uh, metric, depending on which uh, you're talking about, F or SSB. Um, and so again, these are consistent with the benchmark. And in the table there, you can see um, what those uh, targets and thresholds are for both uh, fishing mortality and spawning stock biomass. I've got some graphs, so I won't linger on this too long, but it's here if you wanted, wanted us to flip back to it. So stock status, take home point here is that the New Jersey, New York bite uh, region is overfished and overfishing is occurring. Uh, the top graph there is uh, the stock status with regard to fishing mortality. And so the orange hashed line, that is the uh, target, I'm sorry, threshold. The green dashed line is the target. Um, and you can see um, in particular when looking at the three-year average, which is the one that we're kind of focused in on, um, we are above both the threshold and the target since uh, the early 2000s for this region. Bottom right-hand side there uh, is the stock status with regard to spawning stock biomass. Again, uh, the green line is the target, orange line is the threshold, and you can see that uh, spawning stock biomass has been below both um, for almost uh, starting back in the early 1990s. Um, and it looks like it's kind of come up in the in the most recent period of time, and the uncertainty bounds kind of jump up above that, um, the threshold at least. But the terminal estimate uh, for spawning stock biomass is uh, below the reference point. A little bit about model uncertainty. So to test uh, the sensitivity of the model to, to input data, we dropped individual surveys, reran. Um, and saw, you know, the effects. Uh, we also started in 1995, so that's a later start date to see the effect of some of the information that we um, interpolated. Uh, and then we uh, fixed the 1995 severe under estimation in the New Jersey recreational harvest. Uh, what, what we mean by that is there was an anomalously low estimate for New Jersey, uh, which has a significant impact on the removals for that year. And so um, we kind of looked at that, tested it by putting in a more averaged value. And so that was another sensitivity to see how sensitive the model was to that uh, single data point. We also looked at the sensitivity to the model structure. Um, we added, uh, so the base model had four selectivity blocks, but we added uh, one with three selectivity blocks. Um, and they're kind of outlined um, there underneath the years. And we chose the years based on major changes to the uh, regulations during those periods. Um, and then there was a retrospective analysis done. Uh, just like Jacob noted, we did a six-year peel. That peel goes across the selectivity block. It's in generally not a good idea to uh, run retrospectives back over selectivity blocks, but um, the last selectivity block was so short 
for this model that uh, there really wasn't much of an option there to get a decent uh, retrospective peel. Peel meaning the um, number of years you kind of go back um, and start the model over again. Um, but, you know, in general, nothing was particularly outstanding, so you can make that judgment for yourself. Here's some uh, plots. So the top left is average F. Um, and so you can see that the majority of the sensitivity runs are all pretty tight, not wildly different from each other. I will note the one that catches your eye, it caught my eye, uh, is that kind of blue line that hangs down there. That's the three block uh, selectivity, I'm sorry, um, yeah, three, the three block uh, selectivity run. That's what that is. Um, and so that's its effect on F. Uh, fishing mortality. Just to the right of the average F plot is the spawning stock biomass, so it's SSB metric tons up the y-axis. Year across the bottom, those all look pretty tight. And then recruits on the bottom, again, nothing really remarkable there. Um, none of the sensitivities indicated there's some major misspecification in, in the model. So uh, stock status, uh, sensitivity. Um, I'll orient you to this plot. It always takes me a minute to kind of adjust my brain to what I'm looking at. So here, what Jacob showed you was this same plot, but just with the, um, just with respect to the target. Here we've got both the target and the threshold. So the threshold is blue, the target is, uh, is the red color. The different um, sensitivity runs are the groupings uh, along the x-axis there, so those are the different selectivities. What you want to see on this plot is you want those bars to be below 1. So you can see on the y-axis 1 um, when you go about, um, I don't know, one-third of the way up there. You want those bars to be below 1. That would mean that you are at or below um, your target or threshold, and what you see in each case here is that uh, with all of the sensitivities, they are all giving the same information, and that is that stock status in this region is not good. So some conclusions. Um, the smaller regional scale was not as problematic as we anticipated. We were a little nervous going into this. We didn't know if things were going to hang together, um, and it did. Uh, so that was uh, good. The models are robust to uh, the input data and the model configuration as indicated by the sensitivity runs. Um, and the status is consistent with the alternate regional configuration from the benchmark. Um, so we can talk about that. I bet we should probably hold off on talking about that until we get to the um, peer review panel uh, report. But um, a long story short, if you look over on the right, there's kind of a grayed out section. Uh, that's the Long Island Sound, just so you could kind of look at it and compare. Um, that's Long Island Sound SPR. But the two comparisons are Long Island Sound, which the technical committee preferred MSY. So you can see those targets, thresholds, and stock status. And then the New Jersey, New York bite. Um, is just to the right of that, and so it gives you a little bit of uh, reference there, and the information in both cases is overfished and over uh, fishing. Uh, There's a typo there, sorry about that. Just a quick note on future assessments. So the technical committee recommends conducting a benchmark assessment in 2021, so we'd like to dig back in uh, in a significant way. Um, in 2021, but we'll all do an update assessment in 2016. A lot of what we do will depend on uh, the decisions that you make today. So, um, you know, I think there are some important decisions that, that you all will be making later that will dictate um, how many updates uh, we're doing in the end. Um, and so we're only proposing a single update at this time, but only because it we don't know what the future holds at this point. And so when we get to 2016, uh, we're poised to do an update in 2016. Um, but we'll look at you know whether or not we need to or we think it's uh, recommended to add another update before that benchmark, which is a ways off. OK, so 
that's enough uh, for me. And so we'll, I will stop and take any questions you have. And um, I think you can ask both uh, Jacob and I any questions that you might have. OK, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jacob, very much for those presentations. So we'll turn to the board. Uh, we're going to have questions on these reports and the information presented therein. Then we'll get the peer review report and make a decision whether to accept these for management use. And then we'll have the discussion about how to apply them to draft amendment one. So questions, I had Jim Gilmore, and then we'll go to Bill and Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, this is a great presentation, guys. Uh, this question is actually for both of you. And you can either team up or do them separately, but um, it has to do with the data sources, and you probably know where I'm going with this. The, um, I think, Jason, when you talked about the Western Long Island Sound Study and you separate out your Maker Bay, it's pretty easy because uh, geographically, north, north and south of Long Island are pretty separate. Um, but I guess overall, you both separated the uh, Long Island Sound, and then you had the south shore of Long Island. But when you get out to the east end and it gets extremely dynamic, because you have the north side of the South Fork and the south side of the North Fork and by on Gardner's Island or whatever. So how did you, there's actually three questions here. How did you um, actually separate all of that out? Because that's a big management issue we're going to have to deal with. So how that works. Secondly, it, you know, depending on how you separate it out, how do you think that uh, factors into the model and how, you know, how much uncertainty that may have added? Because you're not exactly sure whether it was from Long Island Sound data or South Shore data. And then lastly, um, we all know the unreported landings in this um, are maybe pretty significant. So uh, how that was factored, and particularly for the rest retrospective analysis, because um, that could maybe change that from uh, nothing exciting to maybe something significant. Thanks. Great. And I'll turn to the presenters for attempts at those three. Sure. Uh, Thanks, Jim. So um, I guess I'll start with your first question about the data. How did you parse it out? And it's a good question. And uh, so first, I'll um, offer a note of thanks to Greg Wojcik from Connecticut, who did a lot of that work. So there's a couple of um, different things going on here. So you've got recreational and commercial data. Um, and it, it, it was pretty tricky. And so Greg did a lot of work digging into the MRIP data, looking at um, the you know, information available in there. And there is an area designation uh, that's in there. And so long story short, Greg was able to parse it out. Um, he also did a little work on you know, whether there was a lot of scatter in that information, whether there was reason to believe that, yeah, the area code is X, but you know it could have been X plus Y, or he could have went way out of Long Island and could have been fishing in Narragansett Bay or something like that. And um, from the information that we looked at, it seems pretty um, reasonable to assume that. And I, I think it a lot of a lot of it has to do with the nature of Tatog fishing. Um, but we didn't feel that there was a lot of um, reason to believe that people were dispersing very far from the areas that they were reporting. Um, and so I, hopefully that answers it on the recreational side. On the commercial side, uh, there's a little less um, information to work with. We worked with statistical area um, to the extent possible. Uh, but as far as assumptions go, keep in mind that the commercial portion of the harvest is very small. So if we were off there, the impact on the overall model is probably not, um, in, not to say it's not important, but it's, it's not uh, very impactful to the outcome. So I, I thought there was a lot of work done on that very issue, because that is the difficult issue with creating um, this assessment is, in fact, why we did not do it originally. Uh, but a lot of work went into that. I think it's good work. Um, and so we, we, the technical committee, were pretty comfortable with that and felt um, we did a, as good a job as we could and, and felt it was pretty reliable. Um, and anything to add, Jacob? 
Nope, not right now. Great. And so while I've been yammering away, Jim, I forgot the second part of your question. So Jim's second question was about how the modeling accommodated those data issues. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think in general, the movement to the statistical model helps that. Uh, you don't have to assume that catch is known perfectly. So there's um, a statistical estimation going on in the model. And, and again, I, I think what we produced was pretty reliable as far as uh, TATAR data goes. So I'm pretty confident that if we were off here and there, I don't think it would have large impacts on the results. And comments regarding how unreported catch might have factored into the modeling. Yes. Um, so I can't say too much about that, Jim, other than to say in the Long Island Sound version of the universe, there wasn't a big retrospective pattern. And a lot of times when you have missing catch, that can be one of the way it manifests. Not It's not always the reason for retrospective patterns, but the retrospective uh, in the Long Island Sound version was not bad at all. Um, and so, you know, if there's a lot of unreported catch, of course, it's not a good thing. It means we're not working with good information. But again, in in with regard to the fact that we're using a lot of uncertainty in the model and that we're estimating things statistically, I think that helps that to some degree, if it is massive, two or three times what the actual harvest is, you know, that, that's a problem that's not going to be solved by um, a statistical estimation of the model. And Jim, if you have any questions during the Coastal Sharks Board, you'll need to get somebody else to ask them for you. <laughs> Uh, next up, Bill Adler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, going back to one of those uh, charts for the uh, New York bite, New Jersey one, with, with the uh, SSB, it showed a little up, turn up. Not, not good enough yet, not up to the threshold, but any reason why all of a sudden that happened like that? I mean, is that a good sign that something good is happening down there? Okay. Yep, uh, conjecture on my part, but it, it is coincident with uh, some pretty significant regulations that went into place uh, during that period of time. Um, I don't know that's the cause, but, um, you know, that is something that is coincident with that uptick in uh, SSB. Dan? Thank you, um, Jay and, and uh, Jacob. Uh, later in this meeting, we're going to be talking about a tagging program um, for the reasons that I think we just mentioned, um, the unreported commercial catch. In our conversations with law enforcement, um, there is a feeling that the unreported commercial catch may be in some discrete areas, geographic areas, could be two or three times what uh, is reported. Our commercial quota is only 50,000 pounds in a year, and we've had some uh, stunning um, busts with huge volumes of fish postseason. So there is that feeling. And so I, I don't know if, um, if you want to, uh, if you can address it either today or in the future. I, I think it probably should be addressed before we undertake such a massive, um, uh, you know, uh, administrative program to accomplish uh, a solution to the problem if the problem isn't really clearly manifested in the assessment. So is it maybe maybe not today, but maybe you you tease out uh, those parameters in the assessment that could uh, reveal we've accomplished some goal going forward if we if we are solving this localized poaching issue. Uh, I guess that that is my question. If we do solve the localized poaching issue, which parameters would reveal that in the uh, in the model. Katie? So ideally what we would what we would hope to see would be some kind of response for the stock so that if you eliminate this source of mortality um, that the the overall total mortality on the stock would be less and the stock would be able to grow faster. So right now part of the problem is the model uses really uses 
total catch as a way to scale some of the trends we see in the indices and in the age composition. So if you're missing catch, what you're going to see is the stock looks smaller than it really is, and fishing mortality looks higher, and the productivity of the stock looks lower if you're taking out all these secret catches. So the model can fit that. It just is basically thinking the catch that it sees is having more of an impact on the stock than it really is. So if we can eliminate some of this unreported catch, um, then hopefully you would see the stock begin to recover. You'd see those F rates come down, and you'd see an uptick in the population. And that, that ideally would be what we would want to look for. If there was a way we could get some better information on the scale of the problem and a way that we can um, go back in time and maybe back calculate some of these things, we can try and look at that from sort of a modeling perspective. But ideally, the result of improving our control over the fishery removals would be a better stock. Thank you. Any other questions on these two reports before we go to the peer review panel report on them? Okay, seeing none, we'll turn to Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, because we did follow up uh, regional assessment work um, after the original benchmark peer review. Uh, the Commission organized a desk uh, review um, for these new regional assessments. Um, as we've seen, Jacob and, and Jay presented uh, Long Island Sound and New Jersey, New York bite uh, results. That is what the uh, desk reviewers evaluated. Uh, we had two technical uh, peer reviewers. Um, in combination, they had expertise in population dynamics, stock assessment modeling, statistics, and TATOG biology. Uh, their review focused on uh, the data inputs that were selected and used in the models and the overall quality of the assessment. Um, as you have received, uh, the products from the work are the stock assessment report for both uh, subregions and the desk review report. The two uh, desk reviewers were Dr. Cynthia Jones from Old Dominion University and uh, Joe Ohop from Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission's uh, Wildlife Research Institute. Um, and I'll note that Dr. Jones uh, was the chair of the benchmark review panel. Uh, we asked her to continue in this desk review for consistency and her familiarity um, with not only TATOG but the assessment models we've used over time. Um, and the, the desk review took place. Uh, they received their reports in late June and concluded their desk review about three weeks later. There, uh, let, me, let me stop and, and mention um, that the review panel uh, commended the, the strong work that the assessment work group conducted here um, since the uh, benchmark was com completed to tease out the data and develop these new regional assessments. They said it was very well done. Um, their overall uh, review findings are that the um, Long Island stock they agreed is, is overfished and overfishing was occurring in the terminal year of 2014, and the same case for the New Jersey, New York bite uh, subregion. And the panel uh, finds that the regional stock assessments are acceptable for management use. You saw these uh, two figures in the earlier presentations, but on the left you have um, the fishing mortality trends for Long Island Sound, and uh, again, the fishing mortality is uh, above the target and threshold. Uh, that is also the case in New Jersey, New York bite region. The first review term of reference was to evaluate uh, the assessment data, um, how the, the assessment team uh, selected or excluded data and how they use them in the ASAP model. Uh, the panel concluded that all potential fishery dependent and fishery independent data sources were thoroughly reviewed and selected appropriately. Uh, the assessment work group used four criteria to decide which, which data sets to use, um, such as the duration of a time series, was it 10 years or more, um, were there adequate sample sizes, etc. Um, the DATOG assessments, uh, of course, rely heavily on the MRIP recreational survey estimates. The review agreed that um, although there are low sample sizes, generally speaking for TATOG, the MRIP data were sufficient for use in the stock assessment. 
Um, they did note in future assessments, most likely for the next benchmark, uh, to keep an eye on the changes in the MRIP survey, notably the effort survey, and new calibrations to the catch data that will result from that change in MRIP um, effort surveys. And uh, the panel also noted that um, in future assessment work, the team should explore correction to the growth curve parameterization for where fishery dependent data are used. Um, this figure, it's a little small for you to see, but it is in the desk review report in your materials. Um, there were challenges in uh, estimating weights at age for the earliest age classes one and two because of the uh, selectivity of the fisheries and that they um, don't, because of the minimum sizes, they don't pick up a lot of these younger fish. The second uh, term of reference was to evaluate stock structure and geographical scale of the regional assessments. Uh, very similar to the benchmark assessment and review findings, um, the growth rates um, were found to be similar from Connecticut to New Jersey. So there's no, um, the growth information does not uh, make an easy distinction between um, areas within Connecticut to New Jersey. Also, the genetic studies that have been completed to date are inconclusive relative to trying to split out Long Island Sound and the New Jersey, New York bite region. Although there is a, a new genetic study underway coastwide for Tatog. Um, so they found that the new regions are reasonable and acceptable, but not necessarily any better than the uh, various regions that were assessed in the benchmark. Uh, the third term of reference was to evaluate the methods and models used to estimate population parameters. Um, their overall review findings were that the uh, age structured assessment program model is appropriate for use of the selected input data. Um, compared to other models, this ASAP uh, model is able to pull in a lot of the available data. And its results are justified for use in making management decisions. Um, again, they, they did see some concerns relative to the weighted age and growth curve analyses and encouraged the assessment uh, committee to explore those further in future assessments. TOR4, evaluate the methods to characterize uncertainty. The panel's conclusions were that a, a sensitivity to a range of data inputs and model structures were well addressed and understood, um, as Jay and Jacob mentioned, or, or displayed in their sensitivity runs. So the overall outcomes relative to stock status are robust. Um, and relative to retrospective patterns, um, the Long Island Sound model had relatively small retrospectives and are not a concern for management action. Um, in the New Jersey, New York bite model, uh, there are larger retrospective uh, biases. Um, the panel, you know, said that they were worried about this and, and that the retrospectives indicate the F and SSB estimates uh, are more uncertain. Um, but they also noted that the, the direction of the retrospective patterns um, switched over time and actually switched to a more favorable um, pattern in the most recent time period. Um, and so, again, they, they think these results are still useful, but to uh, continue to keep an eye on retrospective patterns. The fifth term of reference was to evaluate estimates of stock biomass abundance and exploitation. Uh, the panel concluded that the ASAP model and associated reference points provide the best estimates for determining stock biomass abundance and exploitation. Um, they did raise uh, minor concerns relative to the plus group designations, uh, looking at 12 plus versus 15 plus. Um, and otherwise, model estimates are robust. Um, in a uh, less concerning situation, you would see similar results regardless of these um, relatively high plus group designations, but they did see some, some different results. So again, they're encouraging the assessment team to explore plus group designation in the future. Um, for New Jersey, uh, New York bite, um, there's greater uncertainty overall in the model outputs. I, I think Jay touched on this. This is relative to a poor stock recruitment relationship and the uh, larger retrospective patterns. Um, 
Jay and Jacob also touched on this, but the, um, the desk reviewers um, you know, had a, a notable concern about the erosion of older age classes for Tatog. This is one of four plots that was in your materials, but it, it shows if you look at, um, these are you know, time on the x-axis and the biomass on the y-axis uh, broken down into the various uh, age classes. And what they wanted to highlight is, um, you can see sort of the last part of those bars, the green at the top, um, that's the plus group. And it, it used to comprise uh, roughly 20% of the overall uh, composition of a, uh, in a given year. Um, and you know, that was the case in the 80s and, and even into the 90s. But um, in the most recent years, it's really less than 10% or even 5% of the um, biomass by age. Um, so really a, uh, the beginning of a truncation of the age structure for Tatog. And uh, finally, the last term of reference was to evaluate reference points and methods used to estimate them and recommend stock status. Um, the panel agreed with stock assessments conclusions um, and found that you could use either spawner per career recruit or MSY reference points for Long Island Sound, um, but should only use the SPR-based reference points in the New Jersey, New York bite uh, region. And uh, again, agreed with the overall conclusions um, that both regions are overfished and overfishing in the terminal year, and that the desk review uh, panel finds the stock assessment acceptable for management use. Very good. Thank you, Pat. Questions for Pat on his presentation? Okay. Seeing none, the next step before the board would be to consider using these as acceptable for management use. That's not a determination of which approach we're going to use in Amendment 1. But if we're going to consider them, we would need a motion to accept them for management use. I got Dave Simpson's hand up. Yep, move approval of the Long Island Sound and New Jersey, New York Bite stock assessments for management use. And Bill Adler will second that motion. We'll get that up on the board. Okay, move to approve the Long Island Sound and New Jersey, New York Bite stock assessments for management use. Motion by Mr. Simpson, seconded by Mr. Adler. Any discussion on the motion? Emerson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in thinking about this motion, I, I actually do have a couple of questions for Patrick. So uh, can I ask those at, at this time? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, in, in the uh, review of, of these two assessments, um, there were several issues that were highlighted. You know, that, that uh, the models had some problems with uh, weighted age and growth curve, and, uh, and that um, the selectivity estimates in one of the time blocks may indicate misspecification in the model. And you, you mentioned those in your presentation, but are they are those issues going to be addressed, or if we vote on this motion, we're accepting it as it is without any of the corrections to the model? Pat? Thank you. Um, the nature of those concerns were relatively minor. Um, they may change, for example, the fits of the growth curves, um, but they would not change the stock status results. Um, and in the, in the communication with uh, the assessment team, um, actually during the desk review with some of their preliminary findings. Um, I think the, the approach moving forward was during the update and certainly through future benchmarks to explore, you know, those suggestions, but they didn't see it as a, a showstopper at this point. Minor concerns. So as Pat was giving that answer, a brief sidebar with Katie, she indicated that if Depending on the discussion that goes on with the next item, those concerns would be discussed in a next assessment update. 
and Katie's nodding her head. Any other discussion on the motion? Tom Fody, and then we'll go to Joe. We've put a lot of work, the technical committee and the staff has put a lot of work into bringing out this information. Even if there's not much difference, I think we should go ahead this, with this plan. You know, we talked about regionalization, about breaking areas down into Pacific catch areas. We've talked about that with many species. And this is the first opportunity to do this. We might be able to refine it a couple of years from now. We might find out that you actually push southern New Jersey into a different area. But once we start with this information, we should continue using it. Because even if it doesn't make much difference right now on the mortality of what we have to do, it's a good base to start from, and in the future, we accumulate more data. It would be, be very helpful. And to prove that we can do this with other species, that's what I'm looking at. So I, can, I support the motion. Joe? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank this group for the work that they've done and uh, point out, well, I guess it's a, a, a question. You know, we, we recently had a, a weak fish assessment that was done by an outside group, and I know work is being done to transition that over so that staff and the, that we can move forward with updates to that in the traditional way that we have been. And I'm wondering if that's the same case with the Long Island Sound assessment. Uh, is an update going to be able to be done in-house, or is there are considerations for how that will happen? Thank you. Katie? Um, unlike the weak fish assessment, um, they used this all of these assessment, assessments are using the same software and the same program. So basically, it's just a matter of making sure that we have the, the same data input files, and we can go forward with that. So it's not um, a significant problem or hindrance here. Any other discussion on the motion? OK, seeing no other hands up, I'll give the states a moment to caucus, and then I will ask if there's any objection to the motion. All right, all the states have had an opportunity to caucus. Is there any objection to the motion as presented? Seeing none, the motion carries. OK, that will then take us on to the next agenda item, considering specific regional management approach. Uh, we'll let a oh, question before we go on to that. Bill? Uh, yeah, it, it, it does say in the agenda that uh, do we have to approve the peer review report as well? I mean, that motion didn't do it. Is that something that needs to be approved? So accepting them for management use implies we've accepted all the reports? If you just add stock assessment and peer review report, because it is one report, the whole thing, the peer review and the assessment is one individual report. Is there any objection from the board in proceeding in that manner? Okay, so the previous motion will then include the peer review report as well. Thank you, Bill. Okay, so we'll turn to Ashton for a presentation on regional management approaches, how we're potentially going to use these for draft amendment one. Ashton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so this presentation is really just to give food for thought um, for the future discussion that's going to happen, um, which is considering a regional management approach for draft amendment one. So right now you'll see a timeline, and I want to caveat that this timeline is it's kind of assuming that the board would choose a three or four region management approach, although um, I will present other actions that the board could take. But as you can see, so August at this meeting, we have reviewed the Long Island Sound and New York, New Jersey bite um, assessment, and it has been approved for management use. Um, so now the TC would meet and perform a stock assessment update prior to the annual meeting. The results would be presented at the annual meeting. The PDT would also have a meeting prior to the annual meeting where they would review the catch reduction analyses. Um, and so all that would then be presented at the annual meeting. Um, and then after that happens, then the board would look at the results and then they would um, task the PDT to kind of d start developing the options for draft amendment one. Draft amendment one would then be presented at the February meeting. 
Um, and then as you can see, we would move forward with public hearings in the spring and possibly implementing um, draft amendment one at the May meeting. But if there was any kind of difference in, there could be changes to the timeline if a management approach is not chosen um, at this meeting, it could potentially have delays. So right now I want to present to you the three regions. The three region approach, which is one, Massachusetts through Rhode Island, two, Connecticut, New Jersey, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, and um, three, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. So those are the regions in the three region approach versus the four region approach. Um, which is Massachusetts and Rhode Island again, Long Island Sound, New York, New Jersey bite, and um, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. So these are the kind of two that we're asking the board to consider at this board meeting. And then I want to review some of the potential, potential actions the board could take. So the board could opt to select a management region, either the three region or the four region at this meeting. Um, it is the, the preferred um, approach uh, from the TC and the PDT, because then it would allow the TC to kind of move forward on a specific management area for the stock assessment updates, and it allowed the PDT to review the catch reduction analyses prior to the annual meeting. And just kind of like a streamlined approach, we know exactly what we're going to do um, next if this one is, if this option is chosen. However, there are other ways the board could go. So we've, I've already done number one. Um, so option number two is the board could select a management region, either the three or four region management approach, at the annual meeting. Um, so after the stock assessment update has been um, revealed, the results have been uh, presented. So this would recognize that the TC would have to complete five regional stock assessments, five regional stock assessment updates, instead of either a three or a four region. So it does add um, additional, additional work on behalf of the TC. The last option to consider is to include both the three and four region management approaches in the draft amendment one. Uh, so this would recognize that the TC and PDT would have significantly higher workload when developing the potential management options. And uh, there is a highly likely possibility that draft amendment one could be delayed if this option was chosen. So with that, I will take questions myself or Jay or Katie um, can refer to the stock assessment as well. Thank you. All right, so Ashton, I'll ask you to put that last slide up on the board. So just to reiterate with those three options, the first one is we pick three or four region approach today. The assessment update that's going to take place later this year with the most recent data available would only apply to that and the status quo coastal update, we would just get that information back at the annual board meeting. If the board went with option two here, we would essentially be tasking the TC to do an update on all of those regions, and we would then get that information back at the annual board meeting. The third option here would then be further putting that decision off until some point in time where we would get the update information later this year, and then once we had that update information, we would then leave the decision point out into the draft amendment for public comment to determine which of those regional approaches we would choose as part of the entire amendment process. So the decision here today would be whether or not we want to narrow down the approach to the three or four region, or we want to allow the TC to go ahead, do the updates, and then get that back, review those at the annual meeting, and potentially make a decision at the next board meeting. So first let me ask if there's any questions about those potential processes and options. Okay. Question? Jim, go ahead. So just so I understand, on two and three, um, they're sort of additive. So you're still, if you do number three, you're going to have to go through all the stock assessment updates. So that's going to be included in that. It just makes it a little bit longer. Yeah, let me add first that, yes, we would be making that decision further down the road, and it would be a question of whether the public weighs in on those decisions or not and Katie wanted to add as well right in addition to the the extra work on top of number three would also be developing management options for all of the potential regions when we go forward with how much of a reduction we're going to take so things like bag limit size limit season analyses those would have to be done for all of the regions for 
both potential sets of regions. And in addition, I mean, just to point out that we all, the also, this um, decision or this question also went out to the public already in the form of the public information document. So the public has had a chance to weigh in on um, this initial question. Then it would be a matter of weighing in on the regions as well as the management options um, as part of that whole document. So as you can imagine, that it's a tremendous amount of work for the TC and the PDT and staff in developing that third option. Jim, follow up. So, Katie, you're going to do uh, size, season, and bag for any one of those options. It's just on option three. You're just going to have to do a lot more iterations on it. Right. So we would do a set of, of management options for all of for um, all of the regions that the board wants to look at. So if the board wants to make a decision on the options here today and say, okay, going forward, we're going to break this stock into three regions, then the TC will update all three regional assessments, we'll do the catch reductions for all three regions, we'll do a size, season, and bag limit analysis for all of those options that would then go into the document and be reviewed. But if the board does not make that decision here today or at annual meeting, then the TC would do that for the three region assessment and the four region assessment models. So um, depending on where the board makes that decision, that's the, the timeline. Just so I can clarify, Katie, the size season bag limit reductions, if the board does not make a decision today, those are going to be done as part of the assessment update later this year. It was my belief those would not come until the board specifically tasked the TCPDT to do those in constructing the draft amendment to go out for public comment. Right. So the we would present. We were tasked to present, or our understanding is that we were tasked to present um, overall catch reductions at the annual meeting. So basically saying. With this set of reference points, you need to reduce F by this much, and therefore you need to reduce catch in this region by this much. The options of how those would be handled would be then presented when the PDT is tasked with developing those options. So that would be the next meeting after that. That would be the, the part of the third option, basically. So, so number two, we're only doing the assessment update and the overall catch reductions. Um, option three, we would be also adding the management options. So today, I think we're at the one or two decision point. You would agree? Yes. OK. Uh, additional questions on the options here. OK, I see Bill Adler's got his hand up for discussion or a motion, if applicable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, la last time we had the meeting, we were the discussion arose as to whether we could split off Long Island Sound into a, uh, a separate area. And then uh, the technical committee did that. And I, I don't understand why, uh, since we have this already uh, at our fingertips, why we can't go ahead with that. I, I guess you'd say it's the four area instead of three, because it seems like at the last meeting, um, we, we, we we're looking for something like this. So I don't know what the disadvantage would be, but somebody else may know it, uh, why we can't just proceed on the, uh, the four region, give them the job of doing the four region option, um, unless somebody says, no, we, we want the three or whatever. Uh, what, it, what do you think? I so the only gain from the board's perspective is that we would then see the latest stock assessment update for both the three and the four region approach. That would be the reason for not making a decision today. I don't know. Does that help you? No, I just, I just thought to move this ahead if we pick the four region one and then proceed with whatever they have to do if they, we're moving ahead on the four region approach. That we could make that decision today and send the technical committee off to do whatever they would do, rather than wait around and say, well, should we do the three, should we do the four, and then wait another two months before we make that decision. I just, I just thought, why not move it ahead a little? Well, that's the will of the board. Uh, Tom Fody. 
Okay, do, do I make a motion that we pick the four region approach? And well, I've got two more hands up. Let me go through those hands, and if there's no other motion at that point, then we can come back to that. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion that we actually go to the four region. The reason I propose that motion right now is because we wait after the stock assessment. If we think the four region is the best idea, I don't want to get between when we have three regions or four regions and start cherry picking which is the advantage to one place over another. If we do this before the stock assessment, we're saying this is the right method, method of doing this because we basically uh, are able to sample out areas that we wanted to do purposely. I don't want to know whether it's advantage if I'm in a three region or four region. I want to make the decision now and I'm taking a chance on whether it's good or bad, but I think it's the proper thing to do. So with that, I'll make a motion that we go to the four region approach and only the four region approach, which I think is option one. Do I have a second to that motion? Bill Adler? Okay, discussion on the motion. Let me see a show of hands of those people who'd like to speak in favor of the motion. I got Jim, Russ, do I have, Bob, you wanna speak in favor also? Can I get a show of hands of people who'd like to speak against the motion? All right, Tom, do you have anything additional to say in uh, support of your motion before I go to the speaker list? Yeah, I'm looking at to cut down the load on the technical committee. And, you know, when we require more information, when we require all that, it's tasking people that are overworked, overstressed already. And basically, I'm trying to be conservative on that time. I know we have limited amount of personnel in New Jersey that can do this. So we're asking one person to do a lot of the task. I think if we really thought that this is the best approach, and we we're able to do it, that would actually give us regions. The only thing that would make us wait for the stock assessment if we wanted to cherry pick was like, well, this way I only have to make a, this much reduction or that reduction is not really what we're basically planning to do the right thing. And that's why I'm saying we should do this now. I'll go to Jim Gilmore next, speak against the motion. I'm not completely against the motion. I just, it, it's a, a conditional issue. Uh, and maybe to get to Bill Adler's uh, question before. Um, the problem we have is biologically the assessments are fine and I understand them. Um, so they, that's why we're in complete agreement. I think the assessments were done right. I think they're biologically it makes sense. Management wise it becomes extremely difficult for the east end of Long Island. It is probably one of the super border wars, uh, border areas, because even like separations between Delaware and New Jersey, or New York and New Jersey, they're relatively fine areas. You get to the east end of Long Island, um, and you try to split it, it gets very difficult to enforce it. Um, and that was really goes to my questions about size limits. The only way this would work is if we have some incredible cooperation about having the same relative size season and bag limits for that area. But it's a chicken and egg thing right now. So if we're going to go with a four region uh, approach and we have that commitment that that's what's going to happen, then I have less of a concern about it. However, if we go with a four region approach, and then we've got very different limits between Long Island Sound and New England and, um, and, the, and then the, you know, the New Jersey bite area, whatever. It's going to be a mess and it's going to be unenforceable. I think one of the things we need to get through this is some feedback from the law enforcement committee about if we go with very disparate measures, are we going to shoot ourselves in the foot? Because if this is, uh, looks good on paper, but it can't be enforced, we're going to have over harvest because no one's going to be, just everyone's going to go out and do what they want to do. So that's why it's a conditional opposition to this is that we really need to get a commitment that if we're going to go down this road, we have to have the same measures uh, in the New York um, and you know Long Island Sound area or else this is not going to work. Thank you. Russ in favor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this is the right way to move forward at this point. Uh, we've, we've tasked the technical committee, the PDT, everyone to do a, a heck of a lot of work. 
and they've come back and, and given us what we were looking for. And I think this is the best time to move forward this way. And, and I understand Jim's concerns because we all have those concerns for different areas in all our states. But I think that can be part of the amendment as it's going forward and, and some of the concerns that the PDT can look into and how, how, to, how to manage that area as best as possible. So, um, you know, that doesn't alleviate all Jim's concerns, that's for sure. But we'd be willing to work with New York and, and trying to make sure we can do the best we can. I mean, that's all we can put out there for now until we see exactly what the options are. But as I said, you know, they've done a yeoman's job on, on coming up with the, the different assessments for the different areas and done everything we've asked them to do over the last couple of years. And I think it's time to move all of this forward as fast as possible. Thank you. Do I have any other speakers against the motion? Emerson Hasbrook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, in addition to the issues that, that Jim raised, which I, I agree with, um, one of the recommendations or, or one of the comments in the, in, in the review of the two new assessments was that the new regions are reasonable and acceptable, but not necessarily better than the benchmark reason, regions. So, uh, you know, the review said, yes, they're good, but they're not necessarily any better. So why are we going to go through a process that may not be any better that than what we had with the uh, benchmark assessment. Bob Blue speaking in favor of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the motion. It, it seems to me the crux of this is whether we try to fit the management to the region or the region to the management. And I think it's the former. And I think that's what this motion would do. And just in response to Jim's comments, I mean, as soon as you move down the road of regional management, you're going to inevitably have uh, an issue of disparity or potential disparity uh, between the regions. So whether you take a three uh, region approach or four, you still have that same issue. Maybe it just moves a little bit, but you still have that issue of how you deal with uh, differences between the regions. So the fact that we seem to be inevitably moving down the uh, road toward regional management for Tatag, uh, I do think the four region approach makes the most sense, and I support the motion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me get another show of hands. Anyone who would like to speak against the motion? Anyone else to speak in favor of the motion? Tom Fody. What I wanted was to clarify Emerson's statement. When the stock assessment was done, it was done on one region. What they recommended was that we split up regions. We do different regions. Because the original stock assessment was based on one region, not multiple regions. Let me let Katie respond to that as well. So, right, so the most recent benchmark assessment did have the three region approach and I think the the peer reviewers comments were more to the fact that we don't have strong biological reasons to split the stock at Long Island Sound versus in lumping New Jersey in with that region so there's the the evidence is very muddy it's not there's no clear biological raise to draw the line so in in at light of that then management priorities can take over so if the priority is to keep a consistent region across New Jersey New York Connecticut then you would go with a three region if the management concern is that we want separate information on the Long Island Sound portion versus the New York New Jersey bite area then you would go with the four region there isn't a strong scientific or biological evidence in the as it is is now as as the data stand now to support one regional breakdown over the other and thus management concerns can take priority in this case okay let me make one last call for anyone to speak for or against the motion okay seeing no one else wishing to speak the motion before the board is moved to approve the four region management approach for Tautog draft amendment one motion by Mr. Fody seconded by Mr. Adler we'll take a moment to caucus Okay, we'll now put the question before the board. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. One vote per state, please.
Put your hands down, please. All those opposed? One opposed. Any abstentions? Two abstentions. Any null votes? Motion carries. Okay, that concludes that agenda item. We'll now move on to a brief update on the commercial harvest tagging program, and we'll also have a question for the board about how that may interact with the amendment. Before we go on to that, Dave. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. One, one question for the next step um, is when or have we already made a decision about reference points, whether we use MSY in some areas or SPR in some areas? When, uh, when do we revisit that or do we revisit that? I just want to make sure I, I know where we are with that. So is it the intention of the TC PDT to do the update with both of those right now? Yes, I think when we, it's very simple to do, to present the SPR versus the MSY reference points um, when we come back with the updated information and so we can make that decision then. Dave, a follow-up? Yeah, just follow up to that. It would be great to see more, um, more elaboration on the stock recruitment relationship. I'm, I'm skeptical that there is one. I'd like to see better evidence. It, when I look at time series that I have confidence in, I, I see a period over time rather than relationship to the stock. And, um, and uh, one of those is a, a parallel with the Millstone environmental data that they've been sampling for 40 years. And we see a lot of consistency between uh, Tatog larval abundance and Cunner larval abundance. And one is fished and one is not. But I think they're both responding to the similar environmental conditions. So I'm, I'm really interested in that. Thanks. OK. We're good with that? OK. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to uh, Ashton's presentation on the tank trial. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. OK, so I'm going to present um, a bit of an update on the commercial harvest tagging program, the Tatog tank trial. So an overview. So the law enforcement subcommittee was developed by the Tatog board um, in 2015. And the, this subcommittee has met um, numerous times via conference call to develop uh, program objectives to see if a commercial harvest tagging program, the goal is to see if a commercial harvest tagging program is viable. So to do that, first, uh, the subcommittee developed program objectives, which I'll review. So that has been done. The board approved those at the February 2016 meeting. Um, then staff procured potential tags to include in this program. These were reviewed with uh, the subcommittee um, and law enforcement, you know, tested these tags in person as well and gave feedback via conference call. Um, and then next, the staff interviewed commercial harvester, did commercial harvester interviews to kind of get a better idea of the handling practices um, that were used uh, to capture to tag and how long they had to tag. And these were all used to then develop the tank trial or the parameters of the tank trial. And so now the next um, step is the tank trial, which is underway, which I will review now. But first I wanted to go over the, uh, the objectives that the board approved. This is a paraphrased version of them. So it was to implement a tagging program to reduce illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing that we know has been prevalent in this fishery for quite some time. To standardize tags across states. So instead of having different tags across states, we wanted one simple tag. And it's also a little bit harder to find a tag that works on a live fish, so it's easier just to find one tag and use it across all states in general. Um, the tag needed to be a single-use tag, so it needed to be not, um, if one were to take it off, they couldn't reuse it on another fish and therefore perpetuate um, illegal fishing. So it needed to be easy to put on but hard to take off. Um, and so it also needed to, the last goal is to accommodate the live market fishery. So it needed to have an applicator. So there was an ease of use for fishermen to use it. It also needed to not um, affect fish quality for its resale. So with that in mind, the staff presented um, about 12 to 15 different tags that could, be used, that could be used in a tank trial and eventually in a commercial harvest tagging program. Um, the law, the law enforcement subcommittee reviewed these tags and selected three tags to move forward with in a tank trial. Um, the three tags are up here, and I also have some on me, so if you want to see some after this meeting, I can show you them. 
Um, so there is a button tag, um, which is commonly used um, actually in livestock, so we're testing this on, on a fish to see if it, it's actually even possible. Um, the metal one is a strap tag, and so this one is used on fish. It comes with an applicator. Um, the bottom one is a roto tag, and this one is used on fish in aquaculture purposes. And these will all be then applied to live fish. And so we're first applying these to dead fish to see exactly where we'd put them on the fish, and then they will be applied to live fish. And I'll go over that. So next for the harvester feedback. Um, so I talked to um, a couple of fishermen over the, over the phone uh, about the potential for this program. Just wanted their feedback on how they fish for Tatog, what the market's like, what their handling practices are like. Um, so they said the Tatog fishery was very much linked to the black sea bass fishery. So when they, they target uh, Tatog when the black sea bass fishery closes. And when the black sea bass fishery is open, they usually catch tataga as incidental, um, <coughs> incidental catch. I mean, catch they still retain and will sell, but it's, it's not the main fish that they're going out for. Um, they generally fish out to 10 miles, but will go further if targeting black sea bass. Uh, they noted that tataga are not as resilient in warm water or during spawning, so tags could increase mortality during this time. They also said, um, after reviewing to them, you know, okay, when you come back to the dock, who are you selling to? Um, who then sells to that person? We realize that it's a very decentralized market with lots of small-scale um, dealers and buyers and a couple of wholesalers. And it's not just you go to one dealer and then that dealer goes to the, to the end market to the restaurant. It's, you know, it goes to one dealer, then it could go to another dealer before ending up at a buyer and then go to a restaurant. Um, and so we realized the next bullet point is that live to talk are held by buyers and dealers for weeks and it could even be months at a time. When I asked, you know, how long do you de generally keep these fish or do you know that they're in captivity? They said, well, you can keep a tatog alive as long as you want. They're very hardy fish. We know what to do. We know how to keep them alive. So it's not, it's not like this fish is coming out of the water, hitting, hitting the dock and then going, you know, onto someone's plate. There's quite some time that passes in between catching the fish and then eating the fish. Um, so there's a full list of uh, harvester comments that's in the May Law Enforcement Subcommittee meeting summary. I also have a different presentation, a longer presentation that I presented to the Law Enforcement Subcommittee on this issue as well. So now we're, um, I'm going to go over the parameters of the tank trial. So this is being led by the New York Division of Marine Resources and Stony Brook University. Um, so currently, fish traps are collecting uh, to TOG, and uh, New York DMR, you know, developed these fish, or they collected, um, or they modified lobster traps to become fish traps to collect to TOG. Um, they actually created, you know, a huge pin to then hold the to TOG at the dock until we have the number of fish needed to then move them to the wet lab. And overall, um, they plan to collect eight to TOG. Um, to, then collect, to then transfer to the wet lab. And it'll be in two different batches. So we're going to do 40 fish and then 40 fish. Um, so each tag will be applied to 20 fish, so 60 fish in total. And then there's going to be 20 fish that will serve as the control group, thereby equaling 80 fish. Each fish will be tagged and monitored for four weeks. We went back and forth on the length of time that the tag should be on the fish and determined that four weeks is long enough to see if it would affect the fish, if there would be any kind of infections with the fish as from the tag, and to make sure to see if there's any mortality as a result of the, tag, of the tag on the fish. So the trial is expected to begin this month. It's going to be underway um, shortly. And with that, so looking ahead, I just kind of wanted to give an update on um, next steps. So at the annual meeting, um, the results of the tagging tank trial will be presented. I'll also have a law enforcement subcommittee meeting um, before the annual meeting as well, so they can review the results and they can give recommendations and feedback that will also be presented at the annual meeting. Um, and then at the annual meeting, the board can opt to task the PDT with developing draft amendment one options for a commercial harvest tagging program. Because the goal of the law enforcement subcommittee was really to investigate if the feasibility of such a program. And so if the board thinks it is a viable program, the tags are work, the fish are not dying, um, then, the PD, then the board could task the PDT with developing options for draft amendment one. Um, and with that, I'll take questions. So with reference to Ashton's last slide, there's no decision point here today, but the public information document that went out included as an item the unreported harvest, and it's certainly been an issue before this board for some time. When we first looked at the timeline, it seemed that the two actions would need to be decoupled to keep the uh, 
draft amendment moving forward when the decision was made to do the Long Island Sound assessment uh, basically at this point we're looking at a decision next year uh, and implementation likely in 2018 that would potentially present the opportunity to include the commercial harvest tagging program now as part of the draft amendment if we chose to task the PDT to develop options at the annual meeting so that's where we're at there's no decision needs to be made today but I wanted to bring that to the attention of the board that where it had previously looked like it was going in a decoupled manner there may be the opportunity to bring the two back together again uh, with that any questions for Ashton on her presentation John Clark thank you mr. chair uh, Ashton I'm just curious as to why the trial is only for four weeks because I if I recall, they said that a lot of times these fish are kept for up to six months, even longer, in tanks. And if we're going to get an idea what the shedding rate of these tags might be, that seems kind of short considering how long they're, they're kept. So like I said, there was a bit of discussion on the length of the trial. And just when talking to people, there was just such... There was such variability in how these fish were kept and the length that they were kept that it was really hard to mimic exactly the conditions that the fish would be going through if it was actually going through the supply chain. When I talked to them about what are the different tank sizes, what's the water flow size, it was so different across, across the different fishermen that you couldn't exactly have a trial that would replicate any one way that this fish went through the supply chain. So um, four weeks was seen as a compromise. Thank you, Ashton. Any additional questions? Bob Ballou. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ashton, you may have already covered this, but it just occurs to me why the need to explore tags other than those that have traditionally been used to track fish for migratory purposes? I mean, clearly those have uh, demonstrated their efficacy. Is there any thought given to just using the same tags that have always been used, maybe a different color, um, to see how they compare with these new styles? Yes, and yes, there was, and that would be definitely the easiest option and would be preferred, although it didn't meet one of the objectives um, put forth by the law enforcement subcommittee was that it needed to be a one-time use tag. And when looking at those tags, those tags could just be easily ripped out of the fish and then reused again, and therefore defeating the purpose. Roy Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Many years ago, I recall using those particular metal jaw tags and tagging salmonids. And if memory serves, um, those particular tags caused a decrease in the growth rate of the animal when it was released back into the wild, thus providing a competitive disadvantage for tag fish violating one of the tagging assumptions. But I assume since these are tanks and these fish will be fed ad libitum, or in other words, as much as they'll eat, that, that won't be a, a consideration in these particular trials. Um, the growth rate of the fish after it's captured was not a consideration um, for this trial. Follow up, Roy. Yeah, I was not so concerned about the growth rate. I was just about the condition of the fish that, that would be a factor in its marketability. And that was definitely the major concern of the harvesters, and we hope to get some information from the trials on that. Ashton? Um, so just, uh, just when talking to the harvesters about this program, there was only two, I mean, it wasn't a lot of people, there was like 10 people that I was talking to, but only two people were, you know, dramatically opposed to such a program. You know, they, they did see that there is a problem in this fishery with the black market and with illegal and unreported fishing going on. And so they were happy that I had called them and happy to kind of get feedback on them. And, and they hoped that such a program would work for them. I mean, they clearly don't want to have any more they don't, want to, they don't want this to affect the amount of time that they put into this fishery. Um, but if it can help them, then they were, um, they were for it. Okay, is there any other business to come before the board today? Okay, seeing none and having covered the business on the agenda, the board is hereby adjourned. Thank you, everyone.
We will start the horseshoe crab board in five minutes. Please be quick.